already, keep it coming at KTN News KE at Grace Courier KE. I'll be happy to sample it. Now, Betty, Cynthia, Wanjiko. Karibu sana. Thank you so much for joining us. Mm -hmm. And you know, as I said, um, has is a story. She's only she's only 19 years old. She at some point in her life planned her own funeral. She has attempted suicide six times, but she is here, ready to share it. And you're now a an, an activist yeah, for mental productive. health, right? Yes, and you're pursuing law. Yes. Wow. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So Betty, I want us to start with you. Just. Um, uh, telling us where you're from, giving us a bit of your background, just helping our viewers okay. understand, you know, where you come from. So my name is Betty Cynthia Wanji Konje here. I am 19 years old. I'm from Thika and uh, I'm pursuing law and I'm a mental health activist. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, basically that I'm from Thika and uh, yes. Okay. There's so much about you that we'll get to know shortly, but uh what you'll be telling us which you know partly i've already shared with our viewers okay did you experience certain difficulties struggles growing up perhaps how you were raised could it have been one of the contributing factors no, no. i was raised very well i have amazing parents who have been there for me continuously mm -hmm. and i have amazing siblings as well mm -hmm. so i think where my problem started is when i got into a broader circle in high school mm -hmm. and that's when i met different people with different mentalities, mm -hmm. with different ways of handling the situations. Mm -hmm. So that's where my problem started. But growing up, I was okay. I was a very bubbly girl, mm -hmm. singing in church, born and raised in church. So everything from my background, from my um, Christian background, social background, everything was okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So take us through now that, I assume there was probably like one particular instance in high school mm -hmm. or just take us through the entire period okay I was 17 when I attempted my first suicide attempt mm -hmm. and this happened when I got into high school and I was this there's something that sparked people about me and it's a certain effect probably left on people that I was really attacked emotionally abused by words there is no single week that passed without a rumor coming mm -hmm. so I think I also had this mentality that I had to be strong. I had to be there for everyone. I had to understand people. So a lot of things really got to me. And then I had a loss of my aunt when she died. I wanted that to get off me. So I didn't quite deal with what I was going through. I wanted things to just pass by. I was going through something, I'm getting this rumor this one time, and then I'm getting another one, and I used to accumulate them a lot, mm -hmm. and I didn't talk about it. You see, the way you can be talked about, and you're like, you can tell your friend, okay, so-and-so is talking about me, and I'm not feeling well. Mm -hmm. Since I was a leader in school, I had this mentality, you have to be strong. Mm -hmm. You are the deputy head girl, you're the head girl, mm -hmm. just be strong. Mm -hmm. So I accumulated a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And then when my aunt died, we were very close, I wanted to just let it pass. I didn't. I didn't go that. I didn't go through that grieving period because mm -hmm. I had to be strong. Mm -hmm. So I had put on that mentality for myself. Mm -hmm. I have to be strong for myself and for people around me. Mm -hmm. What I didn't realize is that people around me wanted me to be me. So I had already put on a clothing upon myself that I have to be this person. Mm -hmm. I have these standards that I have raised for myself that are too high. And when I don't reach them, I feel frustrated. Mm -hmm. So that's when my problem started, when I had so many things that had accumulated mm -hmm. and I just had an outburst and boom, bipolar came through. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, but that's where you tell us about your first yeah. attempt to commit suicide. Yeah. Perhaps how, what did you do? Yeah, it's the first attempt, oh yeah, I was 17, mm -hmm. I took 30 bascopans. Mm -hmm. Bascopans, yeah, bascopans are like painkillers, mm -hmm. very strong painkillers, mm -hmm. and then it didn't work. And I felt just dizzy, and the hunger for death kept growing, because mm -hmm. each time I wanted to die and I'm not dying, that was a stress in itself. So that was added stress mm -hmm. on top of my stress. Mm -hmm. So the second time in a span of I think four weeks or a month, mm -hmm. I took 25 pound stands. Mm -hmm. It didn't work. I got dizzy and I felt it's just this normal effects of sleeping a lot, you see, but I had not achieved my goal. I was looking forward to death. Mm -hmm. The way people look forward to life, mm -hmm. I was looking forward to death because mm -hmm. I felt like the world will be a better place without me. Mm -hmm. The things that I was like, hearing people say and how people were being so inconsiderate, I felt like I didn't deserve it. And I was such a good person 
and I was receiving so much that I didn't expect. Mm -hmm. So I was like, maybe if I left this world, then things will be better. They will just stop picking on me like that, you get? So the third attempt was after a research I had around school as well. And uh, my desk mate, the dad was a doctor. And um, that was, I was very strategic because this, this is my classmate, the dad is a doctor, mm -hmm. and she used to have a certain knowledge of drugs and tablets. And so I asked her, do you have a history of a certain drug that one can take that is very serious? She was so confident in telling me a drug called cet cetrazine. She wasn't <laughs> suspicious of anything. No, she, she wasn't. Any questions. You know, with, with depression, something I've understood is that at times you look okay. Mm -hmm. Depression has no face. Mm, you cannot yeah, say that depression yeah, has a specific yeah, space. Yeah. And you know, I was very bubbly, always talking about it. Mm -hmm. It was so hard for anyone to say, Betty has depression, sure. Betty is depressed, because sure. sure. I always wanted to look happy. So I asked her, which drug do you know? Which history do you know? And she told me Cetrazine. Mm -hmm. And I was so sure that Cetrazine would work. Mm -hmm. That's when I acted. I started acting like someone who's going. Like I used to uh, tell my friends, I used to be now nice, because I knew these are my last days. I want, a, I want a story after I'm dead. I want these people to say, during her last days, Betty was energetic. Betty was nice to be. So at the end of it all, I knew Cetrazine would work. So I took 15 of them. When I took them, um, I remember now waking up in hospital, and that is when I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. Mm -hmm. And now I had an actual name to what I was going through. Mm -hmm. But then again, I felt relieved. At the same time, I felt like this was added stress. Now this is a disease that no one in my family, in my history, There's no one history. has had this. Mm -hmm. I had never had the name bipolar in Kenya. Mm -hmm. I only knew it from places like America. So I thought it's a foreign disease, mm -hmm. near Wazungu, you mm -hmm. see? The mentality that people have. Yeah. The mental illness is for people in, in America or people abroad, mm -hmm. you get? So I had never heard of it in Kenya. Mm -hmm. And here is me, 17, about to turn 18, and I'm told I have bipolar. And the way that news was broken down to me, they said it's incurable. Mm -hmm. So me, I had a mentality of this is like cancer. Mm -hmm. This is something serious. Mm -hmm. So at, I felt relieved because now what I was going through, because what I was going through was not given a name. So I, I felt like I was being selfish. Mm -hmm. I want to die. People around me are really nice. My mom is amazing. My dad is amazing. Mm -hmm. My siblings are amazing. I've grown up very well with no struggle. Mm -hmm. I've had favor in my school of being the head girl despite the disadvantages that came with it. And I want to die. So I felt like I was being selfish. Mm -hmm. And when all these feelings were given a name by Paula, I felt, OK, so this explains why I've been having mood swings, because mm -hmm. bipolar is a mood disorder. Yeah, one this explains you're all high, the other you low. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So I felt like, oh, yeah. This explains why, but I still felt like I'm having enough of the world. I still felt like people were still talking because I didn't go to school and say, hi guys, my name is Betty, I'm a head girl and I have bipolar. Please stop talking about me, you get? And I, would, I, I, I was not so verbal about it because this is depression. Depression is, I thought it's a rich kid's problem, mm -hmm. is an abroad is an abroad problem and here is me with it. Will people say I'm faking? Will people say that I'm being selfish with myself? Mm -hmm. Will people um, stigmatize me? Will this, da 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 da? Will I have those questions mm -hmm. if I talk about it? What will happen to me? And I started, my fourth attempt was a mixed attempt. I used to feel frustrated and take any pills I would find a way. Mm -hmm. I, I will find out my way. If it's Panadols, I will just have a, overdose them. The side effect was just maybe sleeping a lot. I'm staying in bed a lot, mm -hmm. those ones, but I had not achieved what I wanted. wanted. So I was put under antidepressants mm -hmm. and I was put under therapy. And uh, that's when I planned my funeral because this fifth attempt, they, they used to give me this tablet that was very strong, mm -hmm. they, that they had to cut it in, into half. Mm -hmm. It was that strong. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I think I had this thought if a, if a single tablet like this and it's in half can make me sleep for that long, what if I take one tablet full, you get? So I, I knew that this one would work. My fifth attempt now, that's when I planned my funeral. Mm -hmm. That's when I said I wanted to wear a red dress, I want jewelry. You put it in, in writing? Yes, I did. And I wrote who's going, I literally did plan my funeral. Who's reading the eulogy? Who's to do this from my school? Who's to, what I'm supposed to wear? Who the makeup, of course, some earrings, some hair there. So I had planned all of it. Because now I wanted 
people to know that I really did want to die mm -hmm. before I died. Mm -hmm. So I wanted people to understand that so and so, you were the reason. I was so bitter. I had a lot of bitterness. Hearing so much false things about myself mm -hmm. and literally being a very kind girl. Being, uh, I'm not, not perfect per se, but I had not put a finger to someone I had wronged so much mm -hmm. for people to be so mean to me. Mm -hmm. I felt emotionally abused. And at one point I felt that this is too much for me. This is really too much for me. Mm -hmm. And I felt like I had so much I was dealing with. Mm -hmm. I felt like I had a cloud in my mind and it was just, I was blank. At, it was that one point in my life, I felt blank. I felt there's nothing to life. Mm -hmm. There's no joy to life. I'm not living for anything. I had parents that I really loved and a family that I adore so much. Mm -hmm. But I felt like this continuous being hospitalized, these struggles, this medicine, mm -hmm. that is added struggle to my people. So I felt like definitely the world will be a better place without me. Mm -hmm. So I went back to school normal as usual mm -hmm. and I kept my plan and my funeral, I mean my planned funeral, a secret. And I used to accumulate the drugs. So when I used to be given those small tablets, I used to take them, not, not take them, but I used to take them, keep them. Mm -hmm. And my box in high school was like a pharmacy because mm -hmm. it has those tablets, very many of them. So this one time after my pre box, I guess, I took all of them. There were 42 half tablets, those are like 21 full tablets. And the next time I woke up in a hospital, mm -hmm. this was my fifth attempt. And I woke up in a hospital, it was white, and I thought I was in heaven. That is one story I've never forgotten, because mm -hmm. everything was white and I was in the room alone. So I was like, Father Abraham or Moses, <laughs> you can just come join me and tell me what's my fit. Because I was so scared, I was so scared at that time. So I got in, I woke up, and the first people I see are my parents and two of my siblings. I'm like, oh, yeah, it's not heaven, so I'm What's good. What's the reaction on, on, on their faces? They were shocked, of course. Are they aware yeah. this is your fifth attempt? No, no, they weren't aware. They came to learn of this actually very later. later after I went public on media, mm -hmm. that's when they knew. But they knew I had tried suicide. They didn't actually know the number. Mm -hmm. So this is my fifth attempt. I've taken 21 full tablets mm -hmm. and I'm in hospital for a week. And um, there's one statement that someone in the hospital said, and it's a story I rarely talk about, that, but there's one statement someone said that no one is going to believe you because you're mentally ill. That thing hit me. Those words really did challenge me because this was someone um, abusing me and he told me that no one is ever going to believe you because you have a record of suicide and you're mentally ill. I sat down and I really said, I want to get out of hospital. Mm. I'm done. Mm. And out of that bitterness, out of those words, I went back to school and my sixth attempt was more of out of frustration. I didn't want to die per se, but I wanted all that inward anger to be given an outward appearance. So I used to cut myself. Mm. I used to cut my hand. I used to see blood and I'm like, I cry a lot, I was so broken. Mm -hmm. I think my sixth attempt was one emotional attempt, but it is the one attempt that has made me who I am. Because mm -hmm. I, I wanted a voice. Now the cutting was part of me wanting a voice. I wanted people to see how depression looks like because people had not understood it. People had not seen the effects it had had on me. Mm -hmm. So I wanted all that inward anger, all that bitterness that I had accumulated in the past, mm -hmm. I wanted it to just come out through outer appearance. Mm -hmm. So I started cutting myself. Mm -hmm. And this one time I'm in school, I'm in my blazer. I used to wear a black blazer as a head girl. And I always used to wear it. People thought it was a sign of authority, but to me it was a sign of hiding all that, all that, all that blood, all those cuts, because I didn't want a story out of that. And um, this one time my parents make a courtesy call in school. And I actually thought they had been called, but they tell me they just came. They dropped, they were going to Moranga because my school is in Moranga. They passed by in school mm -hmm. and I'm wearing this blazer. And I see them and we get to behind the deputy's office and we sit down and I break down and I remove my blazer. And uh, these cuts, my hand looked, looked really bad. They were like numb um, curtains and they looked at me and they took me home. 
that day mm -hmm. and that's when my journey started my journey of healing started mm -hmm. it's not been it's not her it, it has not been an easy journey as well mm -hmm. but it has been a worthwhile journey mm -hmm. from where i was from the very first attempt having all those drugs in my system having all those cuts on my hand all those scars and getting to understand what bipolar is getting a supportive family as well mm -hmm. it has been a worthwhile journey mm -hmm. and that's my story and of course we'll be getting you know to each and every step that you have detailed for us because Betty I just figured out it's in a span of two years yeah. between you know when you were 17 and 19 and you attempted suicide six times yeah. right okay there's something you mentioned about when you were planning for your funeral yeah. that you wanted anybody who had offended you yeah. to know that they're the reason right yeah. just take us through that I felt that some people, some specific people, the words of people and um, what I had been through in school, I felt like they were the reason I was going through this. So all that was as a result of bitterness. All that me wanting them to know that this is why I did this, me wanting people to know that I had actually contemplated suicide because no one knew it, only the administration for the sake of your yeah, administration, probably the deputy and the head teacher, and they were very supportive, very supportive. Mm -hmm. But I was really bitter from all the things that I was hearing from people who were close to me, friends, um, people who I had called the best friends, people who had pretended to work with me. And every week, literally every week, had a new story about Betty. Mm -hmm. I was always on the headlines in my school, I guess. Mm -hmm. And when you get to dig deep into this story, you get to see it's such a cooked story. You even wonder, is it you the main character in this story? Mm -hmm. So I felt bitter, and I wanted that bitterness to be transferred to anyone who had talked ill of me, mm -hmm. anyone who had hurt me in the past. I wanted all that bitterness to be transferred to them after I died. And that is why I, I planned my funeral, and I actually had a segment where I said that words really do break people. We say sticks and stones, blah, blah, blah. Words don't break you, they shape you. No, words actually do break people. And that's why people should be careful. When you're about to say something, ask yourself, is it going to really benefit the person? Mm -hmm. Is it something that is going to break the person? Mm -hmm. People should just be careful because words really do hurt. Mm -hmm. And once you realize that the words that you're talking against someone are not true, the person does get hurt because this is something cooked up. This is bullying in itself. This is bullying in totality, actually. This is bullying. Mm -hmm. So I really felt like I wanted my bitterness, all my pain, all my struggles to be transferred to anyone who was a shareholder in my misery in school. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You kept it, the eulogy? Yes, I did. Mm -hmm. it's, it's somewhere safe. I, I couldn't tear it. It's something I have to so look at. At, at that point, yeah. um, uh, like, did you keep it at a place where, in case anything happened, you know, it would be easily accessible? Yes, I had told my friend. You had uh, told Yeah, I friend. had told my friend, my best friend, that this, when, once I'm, I'm gone, mm -hmm. please take this to my parents. This is how I want everything to be. Please take it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What was her reaction? She was shocked. She cried, of course, because I had already told her to vow not to tell anyone. And apparently she did in the end, but she was shocked. She didn't understand. She didn't know about depression as well. There is something people don't have um, a lot of knowledge about mm -hmm. depression and how to handle someone who's depressed, mm -hmm. what to tell someone who's depressed. And funny enough, most of the words she would say would push me to depression, but she was saying it out of a clean place. For example, she would say something like, um, why do you want to die? And the way you have a good life. Do you know there are people who are suffering outside? So such words used to really drive me to depression. But from her, it came from a safe place, a safe place of, I'm just trying to help yeah. her. She didn't yeah. know. Yeah. But when I hear that, I used to get this mentality of, so what I'm going through is not valid. Mm -hmm. Isn't my trauma really valid? So someone who is going through other struggles rather than mine is someone who is worthy depression. Mm -hmm. So what are you telling me? So she was surprised and she did keep, she did keep the eulogy. And after I think some weeks, then she took it to the principal and it now became a story in itself. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I was returned back my eulogy and it's somewhere safe. Did it get to other students? No, 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 no. it did not, no, no. Till date, 
people in my school know about my journey when I started going live on TV. Mm -hmm. No one from school really knew about it. But in the last days when I was doing my KCSE, I told them about bipolar. Mm -hmm. I, gave, I gave my, my journey not in details about the suicide attempt because I was really careful with people. I'm telling this. Mm -hmm. I was not sure how they'll take it. But I really did tell people there's this thing that I'm having and it's called bipolar mm -hmm. and it's caused by this and that. And out of that, they came a story as, as well. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I did tell people about bipolar, not the suicide attempts per se. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I started by asking about your background because I also wanted to, you know, understand where you're coming from. Because, you know, for most people, uh, Probably the way they were raised could have been a contributing factor to this, as I did ask you, Betty, yeah. and that was not the case for you. Yeah. So you're from this supportive family. You have parents that love, that support you. They, they got you, as we say. Mm -hmm. Did they not see, I, I know, you know, you were in school, you were not yeah. at home, but did anybody spot this from the right, from the, from, from the first time you attempted suicide? No. No. No, no. Not even your teachers? No. No. One. I, I used to have this this fake it face, just fake it, fake it for some time. Mm -hmm. Don't show people your weaknesses. I think that's what I had told myself. Being being the highest um, rank of leadership, being the head girl, I didn't want so much drama around it. Mm -hmm. But I used later on is when I'm seen. I used to have these symptoms that I wish someone would have seen. Like I will stay in bed the whole day. Mm -hmm. Yes, my dad will come and tell me, get out of bed, it's okay, just get out of bed. Or I will skip meals and uh, probably they thought it's diet. I was so, in, I, I didn't sleep a lot. Probably they thought I'm reading. So there was that probably she is, probably she is. Because I was not, as I say, depression has no face. And I'm this bubbly girl, ever talkative ever expressing what I'm feeling. But at that time, it was so hard for me to express what I'm feeling because it was inside me. So at, yes, I did want someone to reach out to me. I did, but it was so hard for me to show people my weakness and my scars and my pain. Mm -hmm. I thought that people would take me in for a weak person, mm -hmm. and I was so wrong. Mm -hmm. I wish I had really shown my weaknesses from the very first attempt. Mm -hmm. Probably I wouldn't have tried my second. If, if people will have realized that this is what she's going through and they will have known a way to handle it, probably I would be just telling people I had a first attempt and that's where it ended, mm -hmm. not to the sixth. Yeah. So looking back, you wish someone actually spotted or someone noticed that there was something wrong. Yes, I do. I wish someone would have, though I partly blame it on myself because I was not expressive much. I used to smile a lot, be happy a lot, cry just in my bed sheets and just cry, cry, cry. Wake up in the morning, I'm okay. I'm making a speech on parade about purpose. I'm telling people they have an essence for existence. I'm telling people they are solution carriers of the world. I'm telling people that they are great. They are created in God's image. I'm saying praise God. I was a leader in school, actually. That also contributed to me keeping quiet. I was a spiritual leader. I was a prison worship leader. Mm -hmm. And so the there's this girl leading very amazing worship on Sunday. So I was like, wouldn't well, they even not believe in God when they realize that this girl here who's leading praise and worship and prayers powerfully mm -hmm. is having depression? So I wish, I did, I do wish people reached out to me because mm -hmm. I wouldn't have gone through all that pain that I did. It was two years, 2017, 2018 have been the longest years of my life, I look back and I say, God, thank you for 2019, it's here, thank you, mm -hmm. yeah. Now that you mentioned it, being a spiritual leader in school, did you at some point question this God that you were serving? Yes, my fifth and sixth attempt from uh, 2018, around May 21st, because that's when I left hospital the final time, mm -hmm. after the nurse told me those words, from May all the way to December, I was silent on God. I actually didn't want to hear anyone talk about God because one, I want to die, God, you're not taking me. So that means you want me to stay here in this world and just suffer more. Mm -hmm. Two, I had not understand that I had not understood that in afflictions something great can come out of you. Mm -hmm. So I was really, really bitter with God. For those months I didn't pray. I didn't I used to sit I used to sit in the front as a prison worship leader. I got out of the CU. I used to sit at the 
farthest end in school mm -hmm. and we were like 1,000 people. Mm -hmm. So people did question why, she see, why, why, has, she, why has she like moved from there mm -hmm. all the way to there. Mm -hmm. And my backup plan was I'm the head girl. I have to check things even from behind. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you stay in the front, sometimes you stay in the middle, sometimes you just have to stay in the back. So that was my backup plan. So I can, I can do anything. You know, I'm, I'm the boss, so I can see whatever <laughs> I want to see. If I want to see them back, I'm going to sit in the back. So mm -hmm. I did question God a lot, mm -hmm. a lot. At times I used to ask him, why me? Why, 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 70, why a 17 year old God, why? Why are you, why are you doing this to me? Mm -hmm. what, what have I done to deserve this? You see things from above, I mean, you should just have this way of turning things around. And I find myself really stupid for asking those questions to God because mm -hmm. he was birthing something great in me mm -hmm. and that if that didn't happen I wouldn't be here with you talking mm -hmm. about this mm -hmm. I wouldn't see many lives on social media telling me I had your story and um, I've gone through this kindly help me mm -hmm. people wouldn't reach out if I didn't reach out and tell people that there's this thing called depression mm -hmm. it's real it's actually medical and please seek help or please trust in yourself, please. I wouldn't have those words that sure, I have to tell people. Sure, yeah. So I did question God, mm -hmm. I did. And I believe, I, 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 people think that depression is demon possession at one point. So I also thought that, that's why I didn't speak much because people are like, I'm gonna depression. I apana, you can't want to die. I, if, you, if you kill yourself, you're going to go to hell, blah, 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 blah. So I had those things, I'm like, yeah, I'm not worthy to be in God's hands then. Let me just keep off God and me and God, we are done. Did I, you fear? You're hearing if you kill yourself, you're going to go to hell. But here you are attempting six times. I didn't quite much think about it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you're attempting suicide, you've reached the end. I mean, there's nothing, there's nothing more to it. You're just at the end. So I didn't actually sit down and think, okay, these are drugs here. Um, these are tablets, so let me think. Do I want to die? Do I not want to die? Most of the times I just used to take them and whatever we later could let it come like that. So me, I used to, I didn't think at my future I'm supposed to be married at a certain age, have kids, graduate, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I was like, nah, I'm at the end. And when you're at the end, there's nothing more you can see. Mm -hmm. What's ahead is just darkness. Mm -hmm. And that is a darkness you're afraid of facing. Mm -hmm. So I was basically at the end, didn't quite much think about hell or heaven. Or anything that comes of the mm -hmm. sort. Mm -hmm. Yes, I was ready. Yeah. Um, uh, okay, Betty, al allow me to say this. I don't know how it will sound <laughs> to you. <laughs> you know, you told us your friend would say things that she meant well and, you know, uh, rubbed you the wrong way. Mm -hmm. But I, I have been there once. Um, and I, looking back, I tend to think that you have your reasons, you okay. know, when you're planning for something. But for me, I found myself to be a bit selfish because I felt I was thinking about myself and how I would get rid of the pain, but I wasn't thinking about my family, yeah. you know, the people that I'd leave behind if I, I, you know, if I actualized what I was planning. So I found myself to be selfish. I know yeah. I'm not, you know, giving all the details and everything, but did you at some point think of yourself to be selfish, that you want, yes, you have valid reasons for wanting this. The pain will end, you know, yeah. and everything. But how about your family? I did think about them once, probably once or twice. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, even though I'm feeling selfish, I felt like I'm doing them a favor. You see, I had reached to that point of having such a low self-esteem that I'm thinking if I leave this place, probably my spot will be invalid. It's just the mentality. In actual fact, it's not the real thing because Right now, I look at myself, if I tried suicide right now, me, I'm like, that spot cannot be filled. I am the that bone, I'm in the middle there. Mm -hmm. So at that point, I felt like this, 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 um, it was also emotional for my parents. This is a kid and they're trying, she's trying suicide and this, that's my siblings as well. It was painful for them as much as it was painful for myself. But I felt like I am relieving the pain when I left. I'm not actually transferring the pain from myself to them but I'm relieving them of all the stress. Mm -hmm. So that's the mentality I had. I thought I'm doing good. I did feel selfish, but at the same time I'm thinking, but if I left, they wouldn't have to come all the way from Thika to Nairobi to see me in hospital. They wouldn't have to pay all these bills or buy all this medicine and pay this therapist and do all this stuff. So I felt like there was so much burden also on them, mm -hmm. though they really did understand 
all this. But I didn't want to hear them at saying, oh, you're a child, oh, we're doing this. I was so much in pain that I felt like, let me go mm -hmm. and let me leave you in peace. If I go, you wouldn't have to come all this way. It's mm -hmm. just the mentality I had. My, my mind, how it was telling me things and what I felt in my heart. And that was basically me. I did feel selfish, but I thought I was doing them a favor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I understand. I do. <laughs> okay, better we need to take a short break, uh, but there's a lot of feedback. Uh, Philip Marube here says, thanks, Betty, for the boldness to sharing your journey with bipolar disorder. Indeed, many BD cases go undiagnosed, and therein lies the major problem. This creates more awareness and will help in early diagnosis to avoid cases of successful suicide attempts. God, continue. May God continue guiding you. And you'll be telling us, you know, after the break, your journey now as a mental health activist, right? Um, M M MW, really? Okay. He says, very eloquent, composed, and focused. There's so much in store for her in future. And there's more feedback. I'll be sampling it at the end of this program. Keep it coming at Grace Square KE, at KTN News KE. We are back after this break.